Welcome to the Texas Values Report. This is Jonathan Sines, president of Texas Values. Great to be with you on another glorious week in the state of Texas. Hey, Merry Christmas to you. Hope you're having a good week. And whenever you're hearing this, uh, it might be just getting up to Christmas or it might be the day before because we've got a number of different platforms in formats where our weekly broadcast and video reaches you. And, and you might be a part of that audience that's watching it live on Facebook right now. And so, you know, maybe while you're dashing through the stores or from one place to another, maybe you're already off work. You're not like our team putting in a few extra hours uh, on this Thursday, December 22nd, when we're putting this together, wherever you are, hope you're enjoying it. Hope you're getting ready to have a wonderful Christmas. And remember, it's okay to say Merry Christmas, even in public schools and throughout public life here in Texas. And that's a big part of the work that we do at Texas Values. And so um, we've got a great program today. And, and you know, look, I've got the, the state legislature in my background, the House. I probably should have provided an update to one because there's a Christmas tree in the Texas Capitol. And I'm going to scoot over there in just a minute. Um, but but I wanted to feature that because, you know, right after Christmas and New Year's, the legislative session is going to be right on us. We're going to be starting on January 10th. It's every two years, important work. And there's no doubt, you know, speaking of, you know, talking about Christmas and public schools, a lot of the big issues that are going to happen that are coming up in the legislative session have to do with the education arena. And one of those big uh, issues is the related to school choice, related to freedoms and opportunities in education. And someone who knows a lot about that is going to be our guest today. Corey DeAngelis has been on the Texas Values Report before he was on earlier this year. And as a matter of fact, he spoke at one of our events that we had this fall here in Texas, which we were excited about. Corey is the senior fellow at the American Federation for Children. He's also the executive director at Education Freedom Institute. Corey, welcome back to the Texas Values Report. Hey, Jonathan. Thanks so much for having me. Well, look, I'm excited that you're on because I feel like, you know, my audience is going to grow now that you had your big national interview on Dr. Phil and the whole world knows you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make sure that I share this on Facebook while we're talking because uh, we're always uh, shamelessly looking for more traffic and supporters to our work. And I want to talk to you about that in just a minute. But for some folks that, you know, maybe they haven't met you before or not familiar with some of the work you're doing, I want to uh, start with the basics and let you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing as it relates to education. And also tell us a little bit about your ties to Texas. Yeah, totally. I fight to fund students, not systems, what most people call school choice. And we've had a lot of success over the past couple of years, partially because the teacher unions overplayed their hand by keeping the schools closed for so long. Families started to see that they were sending their kids to institutions that, that weren't aligned with their values. And that sparked a parent revolution that we've all been waiting for. And it really made another case for school choice that's more powerful than the case based on low test scores in the public schools. It's that families want schools that are aligned with their values. They want to send their kids to institutions that uh, teach family values. And my ties to Texas is I actually grew up in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I went to public schools all through K through 12. And in high school, I had the opportunity to go to a magnet school, which is a school of choice, but it's still run by the, the district or the government. You're not residentially assigned to magnet schools, though. So Texas has some great school choice options in that arena, but Texas is lacking in the private school choice arena, allowing families to take their kids' education dollars to a private uh, provider of the service, whether that's a religious school or non-religious school. 31 other states in D.C. have some type of private school choice program. Texas does not. And I, I'm happy to announce that uh, I was living in D.C. for like five years or so, and I was in Arkansas doing my Ph.D. before that, but I am back in San Antonio. I'm a Texas resident again. I'm out of the swamp, and it's great to be here, hopefully with good timing, uh, for the year of school choice passing in Texas. 2023, uh, school choice is a GOP legislative priority. In fact, it's a top eight GOP legislative priority this session. And 88% of Republican primary voters in Texas supported school choice on the ballot in March of 2022. Nine points higher than the support that was on the ballot in 2018. So that's um, from 79% to 88%. There's a whirlwind of support behind us. The wind is at our backs. And look, the Texas AFT Teachers Union can block me on Twitter, but they can't block me in real life. Uh, it's great to 
to be in Texas and um, uh, I'll, I'll be at the Capitol much more often this, this session. Well, and look, we'll be looking for you. Our office is literally across the street from the Capitol. We're at 10th and Congress. You can't get any closer to the Capitol when you're on Congress than our building is. We're really excited about that. And that's a little note to our supporters, too. If you're sending in that donation, our address has changed. Make sure you check our website, 1005 Congress Suite 830, just so you're aware. But, Corey, look, it's good that you're in Texas, right, that you're back in Texas uh, and I know there are other states you're gonna that you care about when it relates to the issue of education freedom. You're all over the country, but you know Texas is a prize, right? I mean, you think about an opportunity that other people will notice that will add to the momentum that you've been a part of creating. There's no doubt that a lot of attention would uh, come from something significant happening in Texas. Um, where you know, depending on what year or day it is, we're the seventh or eighth largest economy in the world. That's uh, that's a big deal, right? I mean, that that means some of the largest countries were bigger than as a state in a lot. I mean, there are close to 6 million public school students, 1,200 school districts. So that could be, you know, a big influence, but also get noticed a lot and do a lot of good for a lot of uh, kids and families and people would be paying attention to that. And so, um, and, and look, as I mentioned to you, uh, I'm hoping to be at the Alamo Bowl next week in the San Antonio area. But I think it, you know, it, and I'm not saying it's a huge deal, but it adds some credibility when you're here on the ground, right? I say it a lot. Government belongs to those who show up. And so the more that you're on the ground and able to have that visibility, even though social media can help supplement that, I think on the ground at our state legislature, there's a lot of great technology, but still a lot of information is exchanged word of mouth because you're on the ground, you're in the building. And I was telling a team, a team member about this recently, um, early in my career, I was testifying at a legislative hearing and the chair of the committee said, well, we're not going to take that bill up. We're going to postpone it to the next meeting. And so I was like, great. I went to another committee room to work on another issue. And then somebody texted me and said, hey, you better get back in there. The chair changed their mind and now they're going to bring that bill up. So it's always good to be close by. Uh, but enough about me. All right, let's talk about you a little bit more on the education front. Um, I know you've been making your way around. You were at our event. Um, two things I want to talk about. First, your view on the election results and what that tells us at the state and national level of where we are on the education and um, school choice movement. Look, there wasn't the red wave we were expecting. There wasn't a blue wave, obviously, but there was a school choice wave. 76% of the candidates supported by my organization, the American Federation for Children, won their races in 2022. And you don't have to take my word for it. You could just look at the liberal tiers in the uh, New Yorker magazine, where a liberal author lamented that education freedom candidates fared depressingly well in the midterms. Well, you know what? They can cry harder because although that's bad news for socialists who want to control other people's kids, that is great news for parents. Parents won the elections in 2022. But, okay. Let me back up for a second. We're talking with Corey DeAngelis. He is a school choice advocate. He's from the state of Texas. We do a lot of work during our state legislative session. It starts in January on these freedom issues. What what was the phrase? Uh, depressing? What did Education freedom ad, uh, can candidates fared depressingly well depressingly in the midterms. Well. It's like, well, that's that's. I'm happy that you're sad about it because oh look, this is good news for parents. Parents won on election night, and even some Democrats in other states in Pennsylvania, the, the gubernatorial candidate, um, Governor Elect uh, Josh Shapiro, now he switched his education platform less than two months before the election to explicitly support. Uh, private school choice in the form of education savings accounts. That was a huge shift. This happened in Illinois as well. And a lot of people are saying, oh, they're just reading the tea leaves. They looked at the polls. They didn't want to lose votes. Yeah, that's kind of the point. And the reason that the way to get to bipartisan support on school choice is to make it politically profitable for the wrong people to do the right things. And the, the change agent here is that for far too long in K-12 education, the only special interest represented the employees in the system. But now you have a new special interest on the ground, and they're called parents. They're the kids' yeah. union, and they, well, they have and, more power in numbers, and they fight harder than anybody yeah, else. Yeah, I mean, you use the phrase, there's been a there's a parent revolution over the past couple of years, COVID, a lot of liberal, woke, whatever you want to call some of these ideological movements that have different names and, and different focuses. 
so many of that has resulted in a lot of parents saying, you know, we just don't feel comfortable here anymore. We're looking for options. And they could be on the left or right. I, I see it all the time. It's not um, that it's just one particular political party or viewpoint. Um, and, and so they're looking for those opportunities and they're thinking more about the economy because you got the Biden administration making it difficult for everybody to make a living. And so particularly parents that are already looking for some of the, or, or been invested in the uh, uh, private school system and seeing the difference as well. I Real quick, you've been in Texas a little bit on this issue, not just at our events. Uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot too much. It's up to you what you're comfortable with, because I know you've had some conversations, but anything you might want to share. I know you at least had a picture you took with the governor. I don't know what kind of conversations. <laughs> the liberal media was pretty upset about that. It's <laughs> like, oh, we just took a picture, but they know what that means. That, that he means it means that he's a staunch school choice advocate and he fought, fought for school choice on the campaign trail. Totally wiped the floor with Beto O'Rourke, who was a school choice hypocrite. He went to private school and then railed against vouchers. That didn't work for, for Beto. Look, school choice is popular among Republicans, Democrats, and independents. And Beto tried to go to rural areas to try to fight against Abbott on this. Rural areas can benefit from school choice, too, especially if you have education savings accounts. The funding can be used for homeschool curriculum. You can use it for private school tuition and fees, but you can also use it for micro schools, private tutors, online learning. And this is the main argument you'll hear in Texas that, oh, well, we have rural areas. Well, you know what? The top nine rural states in the country, according to Census Bureau data, they all have some form of private school choice. Their rural public schools are fine. West Virginia, for example, one of the most rural areas in the country, has one of the biggest school choice programs. All families, regardless of income, can take their kids' state-funded education dollars to a private charter or homeschool option without any restrictions on income eligibility. That is a massive education savings account program in, in West Virginia. And if you look at the voters in rural areas, they happen to be heavily Republican areas. This is a Republican Party platform issue. And if you want to learn more about my rebuttal to this argument, you can look at the Wall Street Journal article I just wrote, uh, The R Little Red Schoolhouse Could Do With Some Competition, I believe was the headline. No, and I bet you've got plenty to say, and you're you're full of good information, and I think that's critical. I mean, if you're going to make a difference, you're going to try to see if something can happen on school choice. It is an uphill battle in the state of Texas. I've seen it so many times. Our organization has always supported it, but I've just seen some very difficult fights. I've seen them firsthand sometimes at committee hearings, and sometimes they can get downright ugly. My view is there's a lot of supportive in the Senate. There's a, a little bit more questions in the House, and some of that has to do with what people think uh, the expected leader, uh, Speaker Dave Phelan, might do on this issue. And so that's left to be seen. Um, we got a few minutes left. So speaking of your ability to spit out a lot of good information, I shouldn't use that word, to share a lot of good information, because it's like that. It's like rapid fire sometimes. I love it. I don't have, okay? have enough time. <laughs> Dr. Phil. You yeah. were on Dr. Phil's show this week. Tell us about how that went and sort of what the feedback has been. Look, it was all about the school closures and, and pretty much the consensus on the show was that the school closures were bad. It hurt kids. But I was the only one on the show willing to blame it on the Democrats and the teachers unions for lobbying the CDC to keep the schools closed. Everybody else pretty much wanted to say that, oh, well, this happened. It came out of nowhere. It was bad. And oh, the way only way to fix all this learning loss is to throw more money at the problem that is not going to solve anything. I mean, that's the definition of insanity to, to repeat doing the same things over and over again to expect different results. And the better solution is school choice. And thankfully, 2021 was the year of school choice. 19 states expanded or enacted programs to fund students as opposed to systems. It provides for more competition. It's bottom-up accountability. Think about it. During the pandemic, the public schools that had more Catholic schools nearby the public schools were statistically more likely to reopen in person if they had that competition nearby than places that didn't have exit options. So competition works. That was in a peer-reviewed study by Michael Hartney and Leslie Finger in 2021. And if we had school choice all across the country, you wouldn't have had as many problems over the pandemic. Uh, so if you want to look at that clip, look, my opening monologue was basically the teachers unions did this. We got to learn from the problem. The private schools were all fighting to reopen. The public schools are fighting to remain closed. It's not a problem with the people in the system. It's a problem with the system itself. And the only way to fix those incentives 
is to give the money to the parents, just like we do with basically everything else. We fund students directly with Pell Grants for higher education. We do it with pre-K programs. You can choose a private religious pre-K if you want with Head Start or other state-funded pre-K programs. We should just do the same thing with K-12, fund the families, let them choose. If you like your public school, you can keep your public school, but if not, you should be able to go to a private school too. Well, and I'm doing a screen share too, so people can see this. We're talking with Corey DeAngelis. He is a freedom, a school choice advocate. And I'm doing a screen share too on our Zoom if people are watching the video. So you can see some of his recent uh, media interviews. I see Newsmax, of course, Dr. Phil. We were just talking about that. A lot of good information. That is on federationforchildren.org is that website. Um, Corey, tell people your uh, the way they can connect you on social media. What is your Twitter handle? Yeah, follow me on Twitter. It's just my last name, first name. It's at DeAngelis Corey. Uh, you can direct message me there. Those are open if you want to try to contact me. And uh, I share all of my articles there. And you can find um, anything that I'm producing at, on Twitter. But you can also help us in the fight for education freedom by signing the Education Freedom Pledge. Simple. You just go to educationfreedompledge.com. That way you can uh, show your legislators that you support this. And look, I do think that it is going to happen in Texas this year. Abbott uh, said on the campaign trail that this is going to be the most powerful push for school choice in Texas history. I believe him, especially after that meeting that I had with him. We know the Senate has the votes based on the 2017 uh, bill that was that was pushed to pass through the Senate pretty easily. I think the House can do it, too, especially because. The, the change agent, again, the parents have shown up now. They're showing up at the school board meetings. They're showing up at the ballot box. They're going to be showing up at the Capitol, too. And politicians from all parties would be wise to listen to these parents going forward because they are the new special interest group in town. They care about their kids more than anybody else. They've woken up, and they're never going back to sleep. And I think that's why Texas will have education freedom, finally. Texas leads in a lot of other ways. But you have to have freedom in education, too. That is the way up in society, and that is the way to have a well-educated populace, to have Texas values um, uh, provided in, in the education system. Families well, look, need to be I, able to choose those things. I couldn't say it any better. Corey DeAngelis, he is an education freedom, a school choice advocate. And, you know, these, these things relate to a lot of issues that we care about, right? When we see the way that uh, th schools are handling a lot of issues that relate to family values, pro-life issues, religious liberty, just struggling sometimes. And we have to have a state law so kids are not uh, treated unfairly and treated like criminals because they talk about Christmas or they bring a, a gift that's religious in nature to some exchange at school or, you know, God forbid, they have red and green plates at the winter party. And so we're you know spending a lot of time on those things and that takes away from the core principles that are supposed to be there. And that's educating our students for now in the next generation. And so it's uh, we're glad to have you on today. I'm excited for the work you're doing. We're looking forward to working there with you, seeing you in person. Person here in Texas on the ground at the state capitol. Uh, every legislative session is an adventure and a lot of fun, but it's be a lot of hard work. And I know you're going to be up to the task. And Merry Christmas, my friend. I hope to see you. Uh, maybe I'll run into you in San Antonio, if not here at the state capitol. Corey DeAngelis, who works with Freedom for Children and is an education and school choice advocate, has been our guest today on the Texas Values Report. Thanks, Corey. Thank you, Jonathan. Merry Christmas. All right. It's good to have Corey in before the end of the year because I know his life's about to get more busy and so is ours. But this is a timely issue as we get to Christmas time more and you think about all those things. Uh, I know it's going to be on your mind. Your kids are home from school. Maybe you're talking about, you know, how's the school semester going? How are things going? Concerns you have or whatever you're thinking about when that next semester starts. These are some of the many reasons that you need to consider supporting Texas Values. We have a $50,000 matching grant in place. All donations to Texas Values are tax deductible um, for our C3. You can go to txvalues.org, make that donation today. You can help us protect faith, family, and freedom in Texas. We're trying to hire for two positions right now. We'd love to bring more people on the team as we get ready for the legislative session. Uh, but we obviously have some other work that we're doing out in Taylor, Texas. Um, that is a Christmas and a drag queen issue, unfortunately, right? So the city there, in my opinion, made a decision that they like to parade with drag queens. They didn't like the one with Christians. They tried to pass an ordinance a week or so ago that would have made it very difficult, if not completely excluded, 
Christians and churches from being a part and participate in city events like Christmas parades. Um, we pushed back against that. We worked with local pastors and churches and got that postponed. We got a victory for now, but we do believe they're going to come back and try to pass that again. But picking the drag queens over the Christians for a Christmas party, it's another way they're trying to push Christ out of Christmas, right? The drag queen movement and LGBT groups trying to infiltrate another area, right? They're in the school libraries. They're doing these events with kids. It's out of control. We're going to be um, leading efforts to address these issues at the state legislature. And we're always going to push back as much as we can at the local level. But if um, if you've got something at the state level that makes it clear, here are the rules and here's how these things should operate and here's what's okay and what isn't and how we're going to protect our children and other people on these issues, that's a way you can really get something done. That's our opportunity in the state legislative session. So that's coming up in a couple of weeks, January 10th, first day of the state legislative session. Um, if you're in town, like I mentioned, our office is across the street. We're going to have some uh, space available for any of our friends that come in. You need a little staging area. Come by, get a bottle of water, put your you know your bag down for a minute, just say hello. Um, we're going to have conference room available for you to come by and do that. 1005 Congress, if you want to come see us. Drop us a note, though, if you are going to come by. That helps us so we know who to expect. On March 13th is our Faith and Family Day. This is the largest event, one-day event on our issues to make our voice heard at the state capitol. Don't miss that. We're going to put a link up pretty soon so you can get registered for that. And we usually include lunch. So that is March 13th. That is our Faith and Family Day. And we're going to have some incredible speakers there. We're going to cover some incredible issues. Uh, probably try to have Corey there and other people that can give you an update on some of these different issues. Religious freedom, marriage and family, pro-life. When you look at how the opposition is trying to now tear down our pro-life laws, some of the bills that have already been filed, that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to repeal our pro-life laws. They're trying to water them down. I think there's been over two dozen bills that have been filed called ban the Bible bills that we call them, where they try to put sexual orientation and gender identity into a protected classification so it then can be used as weapons to attack people of faith and Christians who have uh, biblical beliefs on marriage and sexuality. We've defeated those ban the Bibles every session, but it seems like every year they just file more of them. And so, you know, eventually you got to worry that one is going to slip through. And so that's why we're at the Capitol every single day of the legislative session. We're the only faith and family organization that has someone on the ground, a member of our team every day during the legislative session. That is our commitment to you. So if you're interested in being a part of this team, we're going to have some internships available during the legislative session. Let us know you want to volunteer. We could absolutely use your help. Um, in addition to that, we could use your help on the financial side. We are a little behind where we usually are in December because of so many of the expenses we've had. A lot of focus on fundraising has been on elections during this election season. And some of the work we've done, we've spent more time doing the work than we have focusing on some of the efforts this time of year when it comes to um, asking for people to support our work. Close to two weeks we spent on Taylor. Um, didn't see that coming, but we ran to the fight when it happened because that's what we do. And we were able to get a victory for now. So we hope you see value in that. That and you see that when you invest in our work, there is always a return on it. And it's always Christ focused. We are a Christian organization. And so that's what it comes from. And we decide to operate on those principles. And we're one of the few organizations that will actually show up to city council meetings and others, not just send an email and talk to you about those things from the sidelines. And look, there's value to people sending emails and alerting people of that. Um, but what I want you to know is we go a step further and actually show up at some of those fights because that's oftentimes your best chance to make a difference, right? Government belongs to those who show up, I've said many times, and uh, and I've seen that been confirmed time and again. So I just have a few minutes left here um, as we spend some time together. I will actually have a show next week, okay? I'm one of those people, I take a little bit more time off um, uh, the first week in January before the session, definitely going to have some time off around Christmas. Our office is going to be closed for uh, four consecutive days, as a matter of fact, as we spend time with family. But I'll be back before the end of the new year. <clears throat> and so we're looking at maybe having a, a little bit of a highlight wrap up show. Talk about the top five, top 10 stories. Uh, I don't know that we've crowned number one yet, but I have to believe overturning Roe versus Wade is going to make a pretty strong case for being the number one story of the year as it pertains, excuse me, um, as it relates to the state of Texas. Don't forget, Roe versus Wade is a Texas case, okay, from Dallas County. And so anyway, I'll have a little bit more to say about that next week. But um, you probably saw our alert. 
the Biden administration and liberals up in the D.C. area continue to try to push these policies to tell us what to do in the state of Texas on some of these issues related to sexuality as they relate to schools and some of those different things. And if you weren't at one of our events last week, um, Riley Gaines, the athlete who was forced to compete against Leah Thomas, this guy that was a swimmer at Westlake High School in Texas and then went to the University of Pennsylvania and continued to swim as a man and then switched over to the women's team and they tied in a race. If you weren't that at that event to hear about what happened, boy, you really missed something. And I think we've got some videos of that, um, our previous work on that with her that I want you to check out because it really puts the issue together to the way that you can understand it uh, and understand what's going on and why we need to see some change at the state level and protect college sports on those issues. Um, we'll also continue to put information so you know the work we're gonna do to stop gender modification. So kids are not being forced to go through these sex changes and then later regret it and have a lot more trouble on their hands on those issues. And so um, a variety of things, protecting our pro-life laws, so many things we're gonna do on the legislative front, making sure in God we trust stays in public schools, all those good things, just a variety of reasons why you should consider supporting us with a tax deductible donation today. We do have a $50,000 matching grant in place. So all donations up to 50,000 will effectively be matched. We've got to raise about $400,000 between now and the end of the year. That's a tall task, but with your help, we can get there. And I know some people have had a tough year. Maybe you've had a better year. You can chip in a little bit more to make up that difference. But look, Merry Christmas to you. Enjoy this time. Enjoy one of the most special times in our country in the existence of man, the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we'll talk to you next week about faith, family, and freedom in Texas on the Texas Values Report.